Welcome to the American College Surgeons Bulletin Brief from the Front Lines Surgeons Voices. With me today is Dr. Miriam Curette. Dr. Curette is a clinical professor of surgery at Stanford University. And in addition, she's the chief medical officer at Intuitive. Welcome, Dr. Curette. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you here. Uh, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what it's like being a chief medical officer. But before we get to that point, perhaps you could tell the audience about your surgical practice, what it was prior to becoming chief medical officer. And later on, we'll get a little bit into what it's like now. Sure, I'd be happy to do that. So I did a general surgery residency at the University of Chicago and then actually went to work for the Indian Health Service to pay back my medical school loans. While I was in the Indian Health Services when laparoscopy came along, so I never learned it in residency. So I did a one-year fellowship to learn laparoscopic and minimally invasive surgery. And so I was an academic MIS surgeon for many years, um, most recently at Stanford. My practice there was about 50% bariatrics and about 50% uh, advanced laparoscopic surgery. Okay, thanks. And how did you get interested in, in morphing your career in, in, into one of chief medical officer? So I really uh, became interested in the use of the technology uh, while I was teaching fellows how to do bariatric surgery. Um, I did a hand-sewn anastomosis, and it's actually very hard to do um, hand suturing with laparoscopy, and there was a long learning curve with them. And so it was suggested to me that I try out the Da Vinci system to see if that might shorten that learning curve for the fellows. And so I did some cases and did some research, published the research, and then started working with the company, uh, first as a proctor and teacher. And then I had the opportunity to join the company as a chief medical officer. Okay, so we've used the term chief medical officer many times. And in a hospital context, most surgeons probably know what are the roles and responsibilities of the chief medical officer, but I would hazard a guess that not everyone understands what it's like, including me, being chief medical officer uh, at a corporation uh, as opposed to a hospital or healthcare entity. So maybe you can tell us uh, about those ro roles and responsibilities, yours and, and others, if you're comfortable discussing others. Sure. But what I found is that the full set of responsibilities really vary from company to company and from chief medical officer to chief medical officer. Uh, most of them include clinical studies, so some type of medical affairs or clinical affairs or health economics and outcomes research, where you're really looking at developing clinical data, uh, both to support publications, but also to support FDA submissions. Um, some people are also involved in product development, whether that's device development or pharmaceutical development. Um, so I have both of those under my purview, uh, but I'm also in charge of our customer training. So training surgeons on how to use the device and training OR staff on how to use the device. Um, I also have the regulatory group reporting into me. Um, you see that with some chief medical officers, but not everybody. And I also have an unusual group uh, called Global Public Affairs reporting into me. That's a little bit different for most chief medical officers. That typically reports in like through marketing or corporate communications. Interesting. Sounds like a lot of different people reporting to you. Do you still have time to operate? I do, um, not as much as I'd like to, but uh, I am able to operate at the VA hospital here in Palo Alto do about half bariatric cases and half uh, laparoscopic cases. And you mentioned the FDA and you help uh, get things prepared for the FDA. Um, have you gone before the FDA and, and spoken with them about various products? We have, um, not obviously with the pandemic, those have all been video calls, but we have had meetings with them uh, there at their headquarters. And we've also had um, programs where they can come out to our, our company and do an experiential learning program and learn more about the technology. They do that with a lot of different companies to better understand the products that they are um, working with. Okay, uh, you, you mentioned various roles and responsibilities of chief medical officers uh, throughout the, the industry. Um, what is the level of interaction amongst 
chief medical officers. I mean, as you well know, as a, a surgeon and as a fellow of the American College of Surgeons, we have our associations, we meet together, we share best practices, we learn from each other. How does that work in, in the world of, of, of corporate CMOs? You know, there's no organization like the ACS um, that's equivalent at all. Uh, typically, it's really more just who you know, and often it is a connection made through your CEO who sits on a board and then connects you with the CMO of that um, industry or that company, uh, rather than um, kind of a, an outside group that brings everybody together. Unfortunately, it, it would be a good idea to explore something like that. Well, there you go. It can create some work for you in the space of our career. <laughs> yes. No, I think it would be very valuable. I think we're all seeing an industry that the FDA is asking for more and more clinical data. So better understanding some of the challenges that we all face uh, working with the FDA, I think would be incredibly helpful. Oh, okay. Well, sorry if I'm giving you uh, potential <laughs> work, but if nothing else, food for thought in terms of sharing best practices and streamlining processes potentially. Um, so how does one get interested? I mean, if somebody, a surgeon listening to you today, watching you today says, wow, that sounds like a kind of a cool thing to do. How does one get started? You know, the company actually works with a lot of surgeons in various roles. Um, we have surgeons who help teach uh, other surgeons how to use the system. Um, we have surgeons who proctor. We have surgeons who come in to do product development and give us some feedback on the products that we're developing. And so that's the first place to start is working with the company, not just using the product in the operating room uh, or in your clinic. And that generally comes through first working with the local salesperson, but then getting to know more of the executives. Um, and so getting to know people outside of just your local salesperson, um, if they ask you to do something, saying yes, that then leads to more um, opportunities and offers. Um, and then there's different roles that you can play. So you can do it as a consultant or a contractor, maybe a few hours a month on a regular basis, or you can decide that you want to come in for testing. There's human factors testing and validation testing. So, you know, once a quarter, you can come in for a couple of days and do some testing, or you can decide you really like teaching and proctoring. So you can do that on a regular basis. So you can kind of find the track that you're most interested in and then kind of figure out how much time you want to spend initially. And if you are enjoying the, um, the work and you're enjoying the people, then you can look to make that more formal and switch from being a consultant or a contractor to being a part-time or full-time. Interesting, interesting. Well, you certainly get to speak with a lot of people. I, you know, it's, it sounds like a, a lot of surgeons also and, and, and see what's on the cutting edge, so to speak. Um, do you find that some of the things you hear are helping you take care of your patients in the time you still have in clinical practice that based on your work as a CMO, you're able to bring some of those things back home and help optimize patient outcomes by other people's ideas and things you've seen and heard at work? You know, it's very interesting. We get a lot of our ideas and direction from surgeons, just as an example when uh, people first started using the system for inguinal hernia, I'm a TEP surgeon and I thought there's not much value there. So I recommended to the company, I don't think you should pursue this. Um, but surgeons who did TAP or who did open really found value to it. And it was their experience with it. And then their feedback to us that made us say, okay, well maybe there is some value there that we should explore. Um, Sometimes it's a completely new procedure that a surgeon sees on a regular basis um, and has found the use of the system can help. And so they'll come to us and talk to us about that procedure development and we'll work with that surgeon to figure it out. Or sometimes it's a product, much like you. You developed a product that you thought might be um, of use uh, to patients and you felt that it would work best on a robotic platform. And so you came to work with us and work with the engineers to try to develop a, a, a prototype. So it is, um, I would say, so much of what we do is influenced by surgeons' actual experience and their feedback to us. 
yeah, I mean, I've thoroughly enjoyed the experience of, of working with the engineers and I have done so over the years at, at several different uh, companies for full disclosure, Carl Storr, Sendoscopy and, and, and Medtronic, actually before then it was Valley Lab and then Medtronic mm. uh, and uh, uh, at some point U.S. Surgical or Tyco and, and most recently in, Intuitive and I tremendously enjoy the experience of interacting with the engineers and mm. trying to get a concept um, from being a concept to being a working device uh, is, is fascinating and I, and I do think it gets you critically thinking in a different manner. Um, yes. So, yeah, no, appreciate that. A any additional thoughts which uh, you'd like to share with us before we wrap up? You know, I think that um, we have six um, surgeons working for the company at some level of part-time and full-time. I think if you're able to continue to work uh, clinically while you're working for industry, it's incredibly helpful. Using devices in the labs is very different than using them in the OR. And it's one of the reasons I still practice because I learn a lot about what is needed for customers by using the device clinically. Um, so we really encourage our surgeons to continue their practice at some point, at some level, if they can. Um, there is uh, a, one of the things that I learned when I came to the company is the people who work here are really, really smart. And obviously surgeons are smart and I've worked with smart people all the time, but they're incredibly creative and really good problem solvers. And so you're coming in bringing a clinical experience, but you don't have all the answers and you don't always have all the questions. And so being willing to learn, being willing to ask questions, then makes you, uh, enables you to be more productive and enables you to give back more. I'm sure you found the same thing with the engineers, right? It's a collaborative, creative process together, uh, which is really challenging and very rewarding but it is a different mindset than being, you know, the captain of the ship in the OR and um, uh, kind of having to have all the answers and, and, and being in charge of everything. So it's a little different perspective. Well, you, you know, it's interesting you say that because what I, I have enjoyed working with the engineers at every single one of those companies I, I mentioned. Um, there was another one along the way that no longer exists, Power Medical, that the engineer who was assigned to me there had formerly been with also U.S. Surgical or Tyco or Covidian, I don't remember what it was called when he was there, but um, fascinating. I mean, brilliant, brilliant people. And what they can do with your concepts, what they can produce and what you can learn from them is great. But I think we have evolved in the cabinet strip in the OR too. I think we are now much more of a multidisciplinary team environment. The, the days of somebody coming with rectal cancer and we say, this is what you're getting are, are, are gone with the National Federation of Organ for Rectal Cancer. We sit in a multidisciplinary team, we learn from each other, and, and we know from a variety of publications, probably in as many as one out of five cases, we completely change what the plan may have been based on the wisdom of the crowd. So it is analogous that, that we go in there and, and you've got different, you've got a design engineer, and a product engineer, an electrical engineer, a systems engineer, I mean, all these different engineers, they each, just like we're sub-specialized, they're sub-specialized. So I, I, I absolutely take your, Take your point. Um, yeah. How big is a typical team uh, as we're on the subject? I mean, to develop just rough numbers of people you would put to develop a product. Yeah, so the size of the team um, depends a little bit on the size of the project, but it will require the different types of engineers like you already talked about. Um, but it often also includes somebody from training, right? Because whatever you develop, you're going to have to teach people how to use it. It usually requires somebody from regulatory so that you can develop what the regulatory path is going to be, which then might also influence how you're going to develop the product. Usually somebody from human factors is involved with it and often somebody from marketing as well, because all of those people will have to touch the device at some point in its life. So the earlier you can get them involved with the various engineers, the better. So I would say generally 10 to 20 at the smallest. Yeah, well, certainly a, a lot of analogies. The multidisciplinary team is fortunately yes. alive and well in, in, in the operating room and in the development lab, which yes. is great. Well, thanks so much, Miriam, for taking the time with us today. It's, it's a pleasure chatting with you. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of people are gonna find uh, a, a lot of motivation in, in what you've said about 
other things you can do during your surgical career. Yes, it. Uh, my words of advice is um, keep an open mind about opportunities that come along. I think you find that they're challenging and, and more fun than you might expect. And I'm really glad that I had this opportunity. I've really enjoyed uh, what I'm doing with Intuitive. Thank you, Steve. I really appreciate the time. Okay, stay well. Hope to see you in person someday. Thank you. Take care.